You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. After centuries of misguidance caused by slavery, colonization, lack of awareness of our history, and institutional disinformation, a new Africa is on the move, determined and getting organized. Africa to Kupamuja. Welcome to the United Kingdoms of Great Africa. The United Kingdoms of Great Africa is the cradle of the alliance movement of all African intelligences around a common ideal. The unity and development of a strong, concurring, and completely dedogmatized Africa through the channel of a strong organization called the Africa We Want Global. You are an African, Afro-descendant, researcher, historian, scientist, or simply an NGO. You want to be part of this great historical march towards the total freedom of an uninhibited Africa? Visit our website, www.africawewantglobal.org. Register and discover the range of our platforms for change. Africawewantglobal.org. Join the kingdom, be part of it. An initiative of Dr. Susan Tata. So, yes, welcome to all of you. Greetings, everyone that is joining and connecting. I mean, uh, greetings to you, Prof. I'm so sorry about, you know, you, I know you, you were caught up in, in a kind of a traffic in a queue today while you were going mm -hmm. for your therapy. Yes, um, yes. sorry about that. And, um, and for all of you who were already asking, is Prof coming? Is he coming? Why are you not on now? You know, <laughs> now Prof is there. And that's why, you know, I, I, I can't go live when Professor is not there. We have to wait a little bit. And, you know, we control our time. We control our narratives. We control what we want to see, what we want to know, what we want to hear. And so, like I usually would say, and I just remind those that, have not done so, make sure you subscribe, make sure you click your notification bells. And I want to thank those that have already done that because immediately we keep warming up the space and announcing the intro. I see already more than 60 people, 100 people joining at the same time, particularly on YouTube. Now, I've been getting some feedbacks. I mean, before we get into the proper conversation and I want Prof to get to hear this, you know, um, uh, a lot of people are reaching out to us like, oh, we are also watching always on Facebook. But, you know, sometimes we just think like you're not live because the viewers is so discouraging. They're going to be showing four to ten to five viewers. And I'm like, don't worry. It's the same thing. The world has always been lying to you, African people, how poor we are, how corrupt we are, how primitive we are, how we are just not even humans. They always had lied. So why do you think that they will show you that we're a million watching when, you know, so they have always have to discourage you, continue to lie in that lie game. But what is it that you want to believe in? You know who you are. We've been hearing all these things. You know that there is no media, no social media platform that talks about the liberation and the history of Africa with top best professors and the best teachers in the world like the Pan-African Daily. You know it. So whether they show zero views, don't worry. You're here to learn. You're here to empower yourself. You're here to get more knowledge. It's not about who is watching with you. If your brothers are not joining and they're not showing it to you, don't worry. Focus on the con on the content. Focus on the programs. Focus on the teachings. You know, try to grab a lot out of it for yourself. You meditate on it. You think about it. Don't worry about what the world is showing you. We all know. And we all, we all know it now. 
maybe two years ago, we still were blindfolded and they want you to be buying. And you see how some of our content producers or on social media, you know, they actually put their mouth in these places, buy views so that people say, why are we lying for? We are not. We're the organic and the original natural people. We're not faking anything. Okay, so I just wanted to re respond to that. And yes, be assured of the fact that we are really relevant and they can only do that to, e to, to people that are re uh, relevant. But if we were here just talking about some, I don't know, comedy or some gospel kind of nonsense, oh, you would have been seeing billions. And they're the ones actually pushing that agenda because that's where their market is. So don't be fooled, Africa, and don't be discouraged. Now you know the truth. The wall has been exposed. Now you know who is who. So don't worry about who viewing, who is not viewing, okay? I just wanted to give that feedback. And um, I'm happy that I'm saying it because Prof is also here. So, I mean, you already know. You're going to tell us why the trip to Egypt was canceled. And we already have been talking about it. Uh, Sister Felicia was here. We were empowering people to buy the, uh, the tickets for that. But only for her to reach out to me yesterday. I'm like, oh, stop, please. Something is actually going on. So I think you like the pioneer and the leader on that ship, the captain, one of the captains on that ship, you actually will be telling us in this conversation tonight what is going on and what happened. But that's not really important. Um, whatever is going to be the story or what, don't worry about it. So thank you for joining. Um, Prof is right here. We want him to relax a little bit. If you haven't con uh, connected, make sure you connect. This is a Friday evening. Um, I mean, so we have the whole weekend for ourselves. So whether it's 2 p.m. out there for you guys in the in the America, in, in what zone you're watching us from, or in the Caribbean, so in Haiti, or in Mexico, in Brazil, where we already open up that door with Alexandra Keto, or in Nigeria, any part of the continent, please just make sure that you're subscribed and you'll be getting the notifications on our programs. Right. So Prof is here to tell us, like we say, today is the African eye. Fridays at the African eye where we collect everything that we've been seeing around, like the hawks during the week, and we digest it. So Prof, we don't give him a topic, as you know. He doesn't need a topic. All of our guests, you just know the, the, the topic and the content of the day. So any other thing that we're going to speak about or we're going to educate you or empower ourselves to learn and teach about, just know that today is a general open topic so he can pick it from any angle that he wants. He can touch on any subject matter. It's general information. The issue breaking or top news or whatever right or even just talking about how his trip was you know to the doctor today is a general conversation tomorrow we're going to be touching the communities and this time like i announced yesterday we're going to touch a special community called the tukana county in um kenya yes and we have a very young aspirant leader that is pounding out uh, uh, empowering youth uh, in political discourse and and stuff and there was a riot in that community three days ago that caught our attention. You know, um, our followers out there in Kenya was like, oh, this is happening for African Daily. Oh, this is happening in the country. We don't know what's going on. So we actually reach out to this community and that young, smart, intelligent guy is going to be talking to us about what is going on when people's voices are not heard. So it's not going to be the Africa that we used to know. Young people actually know what they want. So we'll be reaching out to that community. Thank you so much. I think now we can get into the proper conversations after touching base with everyone and saluting you, Cheryl. Thank you and welcome. Bantu, welcome. Johnny Boy, I see all of you settling. Kofi, I think you're also in. Hey, Ebukun, thank you so much. And you know what you're doing, family, when you're here. So you make sure you encourage people to subscribe, those that are new, and you moderate the conversations as it goes. If Prof says something that you need to re-emphasize again in the chat, make sure you capture everything that we need to learn and you put it in the chat because you know you are the one moderating the chat room out there. And make sure that they're not illicit comp content. Remember, we're always infiltrated and you know them. So when you get such brothers or sisters or strangers that don't even know who they are and feel infiltrating our platforms, you know what to do, isn't it? So thank you so very much. And we're going back to uh, Prof. You're so relaxed <laughs> and we don't like to see you relax. Of course, we want to get you to work, Prof. 
Yes. Who are you talking to on the phone? <laughs> All right, I think uh, we will have to um, give him time to finish with his conversation on the telephone, um, trying to ask people to connect. Uh, 2020 Cap Tree, I see you uh, for the first time. I don't really know, NS Parker. Thank you, thank you, my family, my team, my moderation chat team. I'm still waiting for Larry Brown joining in all the way from Belgium. All of you, Suyini Nyakbana, my brother. Thank you, thank you. Madasa, welcome here, okay? Yep, thank you for being here. And all of you that are joining, yes, I saw somebody say he's a Facebook user, Patricia from SC. What is the SC? Is the Southern Cameroons, Patricia? Thank you for being here. Rose Guanfobe, you said, I'm very happy and blessed to join live. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, sister. We're also so happy to have you here tonight. And uh, you, you're really on time, particularly when Prof is sitting in. I know a lot of people are still trying to like, was he really here? And so they show their faces and go back to arrange themselves. Mm -hmm. Some of you are working. Yes. All right, um, Prof, are you there? Let me just, can I speak just to tell them today? Yes. The, the, today is the 11th of November. And the time is in the U.S. 2.33 on the 11th of uh, February. So you know I'm really here. Okay. 11th of February. Okay. I thought you said November. Oh, I was no. like, African I day. First. <laughs> <laughs> 11th of February. Well, well it, for your time, I don't, you may already be to the 12th, but I'm here on the 11th of February, 22. Um, it's live. And so we do our thing. You, you, we, 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 we all almost have listened to your telephone conversation. What was that conversation about? Where people really wanted to find is this live or is just a rebroadcast? I, I, I really, I was talking, um, talking to members of the Happy um, group, but oh. I won't be able to comment. That's an ongoing situation right now with the government of Egypt, and so I cannot yes. make a comment at this time. On, on what's happening. It's all right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. We do understand. Tell the people they got to indulge one more phone call. My daughter's telling me when my grandchildren's going to get here. Okay, no problem. I'll still be here because I'm greeting all those that are joining us, like Anna Loom. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. It's been a while. It's been a while. I've been checking out on you. Bibi Connie, thank you. Eve Msa Felda. Felda. He said, greeting, Baba Felda looks like a German name, right? Yeah. Ivel um, Felda. He's actually, Ken Felda is Kenyan and African American. Yes, you see. And Jetun, thank you. Thank you, Jetun. Sainovia, Queen. Queen. Queen, Sainovia. Thank you. I think, uh, Prof, we can go. Our whole family in the, in the chat uh, family mm -hmm. is right here. Yeah. And they will take control of everything. So how has yeah. it been out there with you? We missed you last week. And then suddenly, I think it was on Tuesday when we had Baba Gavi. In, in, and I thought it would have been you. And so there's been mm -hmm. some one, two, three things. What's been going on? What's up? Yes. You know, I've been wrestling with the medical care for my knee replacement. But that's coming along very well. But I do have Beautiful. to do physical therapy in the mornings. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's rougher than others. And last week we lost one of our senior brothers who was a revolutionary leader who fought in, in um, Namibia um, and he's from America and he fought in the streets of America, um, brother Atim Ferguson. And so I had to attend that funeral. That's why I missed last week. He has been an extraordinary fighter against the drug dealings in our community um, him and his comrades even went to prison for kicking the doors in on the drug houses and run the drug dealers out. But instead of arresting the drug dealers, they arrest the brothers from the community who he was leading. But he was a great teacher and a good friend and comrade. And so we, we're going to miss him. He's with the ancestors now. So he could probably do even more work for our people from that place. Sure. You know? mm. And so the, the rest is just trying to get myself focused, you know, like it's been four months 
I had a complete knee replacement. And I'll tell people, they took my mother's knee out of me and threw it in the garbage. And they gave me a mechanical one. Right? So it takes getting used to this thing, though you can't see it. Um, and my body's adjusting well. So I'm, I'm, I'm good. And just when you're down like that for almost four months and you're taking medication and painkillers, it throws your whole spirit off. And you have yes. to reorganize your spirit and get back to the world. So that's what I've been going through for the last few weeks, trying to get back to focus and to tell our people we are at war. Yes, we are lovable people. We want peace with everyone, but no one wants peace with us on the terms that leads us to be free people. If you want peace with me, the African nation of the world, then allow me my freedom. You can't say, I want peace, but I'm going to make you a slave. I want peace, but you're going to be my colonial subject like Mali and, and the Francophone states. I want peace, but I want to be able to steal the wealth of Africa and give you nothing. I want peace, but you can't get your historical ancestral artifacts out of my museums of Europe and America. I, you only want peace if you give me justice. We have a term in America we use, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. And so I didn't start this war. My ancestors and your ancestors did not start this war. These people came to our home, stole us and sold us all over the world, not just America. America is the only place we were enslaved. They enslaved us in Brazil. The largest African population in one nation outside of Africa is Brazil. They enslaved us in Central America, in the Caribbean islands, in the Arabian Peninsula, in India, in Europe, even in China. Do you understand me? History will erase the white man's mystery. And it's important to remove the mystery so you can see the facts of history. You can't plan on fantasy. You can't build with make-believe. You have to have reality to build. And you have to have facts to plan. And so we must learn our history and not be afraid of anyone because the work we are doing is for our children and our grandchildren and our great children. That is our only purpose. And if we don't want them to be free, then say that. Say, we are, oh, we're all slaves. We enjoy slavery. Oh, colonialism is fine. There's nothing wrong with the colonialism. I'll be on the bottom. He can step on my back and spit in my face and defame my shrine and have no respect for my culture, my language and my music and my dance. And I'll say, oh, that's fine. He just doesn't understand. Well, that's not what's going on. They understand very, very well. We're being robbed. They're stealing our future. They're stealing our minds. They're stealing our children's future. The gold, the diamond, the platinum, the cobalt, the fresh fruits, the healthy soil in Africa belongs to our children. And when they pollute that soil, and when they bring their GMOs and destroy the plants, they're destroying the food of the future for our children. When they poison the soil, they're keeping our children from having healthy agriculture 100 years from now. When they take the wealth out of our country, build their country and laugh at us and say, oh, there we are living in poverty. I'm in poverty because you just robbed me. You took all of my wealth. You just robbed me. You put a missile to my head. You put a gun, an automatic gun to my head. You held my wife and children hostage and you robbed me. And then so now you have nothing. Oh, look at him. He has nothing because you robbed me of my wealth. So for my people, we're listening. I'm not angry with anyone. I may sound angry because a man should be a man. I'm not a woman. I'm a man. You understand, Ms. Susan? <laughs> I hear you, Prof. I am a man. And I must conduct myself like a man. And that's what I've done my entire life. Even when it has cost my family. You know, I've done what an African man was supposed to do. And that is to fight 
in defense of the African world family, to teach the knowledge I gained from those experiences and the knowledge I gained from our ancestors. This is a simple proposition. Do we have to continue scattering and leaving our homes, leaving our beautiful Africa, and run to England in the cold, and run to Germany, and to Italy, and die on ships in the Mediterranean, and run to America, and run to other places just to eat? Why can't we just sit at home and eat what's ours? Why can't we just sit at home and go to a university that will give us the skills and the training we need to do and build the Africa we say we want? Why do we have to abandon our mother and our father and our grand people with the hope that in four years, eight years, I'll be able to send you some money back from someplace abroad where you won't even see your child for maybe 20 years again? This all has to stop. This is really not complicated what we're talking about here. We're talking about the ability for the African world to provide food, to provide the clothing, to provide the shelter, to provide the safety and security for our people. And we cannot do that if we continue to allow other people to rob us of our wealth, to misuse our men, to misuse our women, and then treat us like we are the beggars at their feet. I've never begged at nobody's feet. I won't mention it because people, are, there's so many rules. I've been in other countries where they put a million, you hear me, a million dollars on a table. And so this is for you. If you help lead your people in the direction we want them to go. I was in a very high position at that time. I told them to keep their money. I did not come there for their money. So we have to understand when we come on this show, the Pan-African Daily TV, we come to talk to one another. You see me just talking to my daughter because I've got to take care of my grandchildren. I'm a grandfather. That's one of the most important things to me, to be a good grandfather. I tried my best to be a good father. All of my children call me at least two, three times every week. There's one, the youngest one, the boy calls me every day. Sometimes I say, why don't this child talk to his wife? <laughs> you know? so he calls me every day, every day. And I loved it because what a blessing yes. that he calls me and he tells me I'm his best friend, you know, that I'm his best friend. My oldest son, He's a big man. He's the principal of a school. He's got a PhD, but he calls me daddy every day. Are you all right? Oh, I just got home from work, daddy. This and that and this. Oh, I had a meeting. I want to ask you a question. <coughs> the phone call I just got, that was my youngest daughter. She lived and her family lived here with us for almost 15 years before they moved. The children got so big and they moved about five minutes away from us but the children still come. I just left my keys outside for them and they will come in to have their hair African braided. <laughs> I'll be up here talking to you and they are going to be downstairs. I fixed them lunch and everything and the lunch is in the refrigerator. So I'm just a man. I'm an African man. I don't mind wash the dishes. I don't mind do the laundry. I don't mind sweeping the floor, but I also protect this household. I also take care of my wife. When she wants to say, oh, I'll take the train to work because she's got one more year to work. I will say, no, I will drive you and I will rush back and God will let me make it to my appointment to make sure she doesn't have to overstress. She's 69 years. She shouldn't have to be working anymore. But we've been in the movement all of our life. So we didn't have the options that some people had to retire early in enjoy the fruits of the land. This land is not going to give me any fruits <laughs> other than from my people. And that's all the fruits I need. This is about the African race. This is about the African world. This is about Pan-Africanism. This is about communal, collective, cooperative African behavior. 
Yes, we have a right to criticize ourselves. Some of us need criticism. But criticism don't mean you don't love your family. You know, criticism don't mean you've turned your back on the freedom of your family. And yes, we must praise the family when the family needs praising to lift them up. But the peoples of the world have made it a habit of just stealing from us. Even when they don't have to steal, we're willing to trade with them in a fair manner. But there's something in their culture. The culture suffers from cognitive dissonance, which means the inability to comprehend the current reality. So they don't know how to sit at a table and make a fair deal for our diamonds, a fair deal for our gold. Imagine when an African sells his or her diamonds, it's called blood diamonds. And the United Nations and the Western governments have said okay. an African can sell his or her diamonds without their permission. Without their permission. Who are they? Mm -hmm. Tell me that I cannot sell mm -hmm. my natural resources without the permission of those who have come to steal it. So we have to think of life. Yes, we are scattered all over the world. There's better than 2 billion African souls in the world. Yeah. More than a billion and a half lives right in Africa on that continent. The medium age is 25. Africa is a young continent. Most of the people in Africa is below 25 years old. I'm fighting for their future. My time on earth isn't going to be that much longer. You see my head's getting bald and everything. My beard is gray. But those kids, you, the future of Africa, we've got to take it seriously. The unification of Africa. There were times I've criticized African from the continent and I've been mean. I upset the whole world once about eight years ago with that. And I was about 90% right. I just said it wrong. You don't beat your child when there's something wrong. You don't beat your brother. You have a conversation. And I was guilty of not having a conversation. But that's not going to stop me or define me. I'm a soldier. I've been in the revolution since I was a teenager. I've taken the gunshot and attempts on my life and all kinds of things. The suffering of my family, the threatening of my children. And I have not let that stop me one day. For those who have done nothing but make money for themselves, you cannot criticize me. I am very sorry, sir or madam, until you put your foot in this revolution and you put your foot in this freedom fight and you put your money in this freedom fight and you put your body in this freedom fight, you need to start studying who your ancestors were and ask yourself if you're doing their work. Because we have billionaires here and billionaires there. All over Africa, we've got billionaires. We've got millionaires, millionaires, millionaires. We've got diplomats and we've got the people who've gone to Cambridge and to Harvard and to Yale. What are you doing with all of that? To free our collective, our communal and our cooperative African body to be united as one Africa again. Because this is not a game. They're trying to recolonize the continent and they're doing a good job of it. And we're doing a poor job of defending the future of Africa against the new colonizers because the money is sweet. The money is so sweet, we give up our soul. What do we leave for our children when we give our soul? We send our children to live in America, to live in Britain, to live in France, and to come and visit us once every 10 years and say, I'm from Ghana, I'm from Nigeria. I'm from wherever. And then those of us in America, we got billionaires. I'm talking, Oprah Winfrey is not the first billionaire, not the only one. We got plenty of billionaires and millionaires. Do they invest their money in Africa? Are they there building clinics in Africa? Hospitals in Africa? What is the African-American wealthy people doing? We have big corporations. We've got all kinds of degrees, but what are we doing? Why should Africa have to borrow one penny from Europe 
African American have enough money? We spent just last year, Susan, last year, this past 2021, we spent more than one and three quarters trillion dollars African Americans did. You hear what I'm saying? One and three quarters trillion dollars. What if we had just put one third of that as investment into African businesses? Then our young people who have degrees and can find jobs could be working, building the facilities in Africa that's necessary to build Africa. Why should we have to wait for China to bring us a chip or America to send some import used car and we can build our own automobile factory and design the cars by Africans themselves? We can have our own Silicon Valley and mountain and everything else if we want to. But where's the African-American wealth being repatriated to Africa? Yeah, there's a few people opening a business here. I have a business there, but we are no money. When I'm saying we spent one point three quarters of a trillion dollars last year, one trillion and three quarters, you know how much money that is? Too much. I mean, I can't even, I can't even. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't even spend it with ourselves. We didn't spend it with black business. We spent it with the Asian business, the Arab business, the European business, etc. There's something wrong with the African-American psyche. And what's wrong with it is they don't know history. So they live in the smoke of the European and the Eurasian mystery of what reality is until it comes home and one of their children is killed by the police or beat to death by some white men in their community. But they say, oh, you don't belong here. Or their daughter is raped and mutilated and left side of the road. Those things still happen in America, even past George Floyd, every day. You hear me? It just doesn't make the news. And only then, when the chicken comes home to roost, do we scream and cry for the African nationalists and the Pan-Africanists to come and help. But where's that one point three quarters of a trillion dollars that the African Americans spent last year without spending maybe just a few million in Africa. We don't need nobody. If we combine the wealth of the Africans, um, millionaires and billionaires with the African American millionaires and billionaires and the Caribbean millionaires and billionaires, we wouldn't have to take a loan from the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, or anybody, ever. So there's something wrong with our mind. Ignorance is what's wrong with our mind. It's not complex. It's, oh, they did this, 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 slavery. Yeah, they did this. We did better in slavery than we're doing now for ourselves because our African mind was still intact. We need to get our African mind back. We need to get our pre-colonial mind back. During colonialism, we dreamt of freedom. During colonialism, we fought to remove the scourge of the occupiers and the imperialists from our land. Now we say colonialism is gone and imperialism is gone. We have more imperialists in the land now and more colonialists than we had before the 1960s. We say, oh, we integrated in America. We have civil rights. America is more segregated today than it was in the days of Dr. Martin Luther King. Blacks in America with all that money is more impoverished today than they were in the day of Malcolm X. We have more people in prison today than we had during chattel slavery with the chains because we've lost our African mind because we don't know our true history. And we have these silly, oh, that's the past. Oh, let's just forget about that and go forward. Try it and see if it works. You're trying and then it doesn't work. That's why you're watching Pan African Daily TV, because whatever it is you're doing, and God bless you that you've been given the insight to watch Pan African Daily TV. Something has told you what I'm doing is not enough. What I'm doing is not satisfying. What I'm doing is not solving the problem. So let me look towards something coming out of Africa. 
brought to us by Dr. Susan Tata. She's brought you the best of the African minds, male and female, political and spiritual, to talk to you across the world, across all the borders. People watch her in Trinidad and Jamaica, people watch her in Barbados, people watch her in Toronto, and people watch her in New York. You know, people watch her in Cameroon, people watch her in Ghana. So we're simply trying to tell ourselves, because I'm you. I may be browner, you may be darker, and some may be even lighter. My wife is much lighter than me, but she knows she's an African woman. And she's always served. Who else would stay married to me for 51 years except an African woman? Honestly. <laughs> For <laughs> real. <clears throat> so we have to look at the world now. Our brothers and sisters in Mali, what they're doing, I don't know all of the facts, but that they want to break away from French colonialism and stop taking the wealth of Mali and letting them keep Paris afloat. And then our brothers in Ecowas, who should have said, Yay, we applaud you, we hug you. They, they want to put sanctions on them, which show there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. You can't tell a nation, people, oh, stay in slavery because it makes everybody comfortable. Oh, well, the French, they, they're robbing you. Yes, they're taking all your money. Yes, the French have assassinated more leaders in Africa than any country in the world, but it's okay. It's okay. They say, parlez-vous français, we say, je suis français. So it's fine. It's okay. So you just put your guns down. Tell them to come and rob you some more. And oh, Mr. Frenchman, that was a good teeth you sent yesterday. Will you send a better teeth tomorrow? I have more wealth he can take. Is that what we expected to do? You know? We have to take ourselves, our minds, back from the European. And that requires studying. And that definitely requires having respect for our ancestors. We are nothing. I don't care what God you worship. Everybody in the Bible, Isaac, Esau, Jacob, Sam, John, Noah, they're all dead. So there's somebody's ancestors. So don't tell me nothing about worship ancestors or Reverting ancestors. Everybody in the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and all of his followers, they're all dead. They're somebody's ancestors. So don't tell me about ancestors. You got books after book worshiping other people's ancestors. And don't have an understanding. But it's probably some of you right this minute shocked that I put it in that way. You're seeing for the first time all those people are dead and you're revering them. But when I say revere your dead mother and father, you say, oh, that's voodoo. Oh, that's juju. Oh, you know, that's evil. And you go worship dead people every Sunday. You worship dead people every Friday. You worship dead people if you're the Hebrew Israelite every Saturday. But you tell me I can't respect my dead, my mother, whose womb carried me for nine months, my father who put the sperm there, because you have lost your African mind. <laughs> and we should say it, we've lost our African mind. How do we get it back? By looking in a mirror and look at that person in that mirror. And when you look at that person, you're looking in the eyes of your ancestors. Ask that person in the mirror, how do you want to be treated? because you are your ancestors. When they gave birth to you, they gave birth to themselves to go on with life, to carry on in their stead. All of our tradition speaks to that. And when you look at your ancestors and realize that you are them, when you pour your libation, you're pouring your libation with the memory of yourself having had an experience before this self was given birth to by that self. That's African culture, by the way. If we're going to have the worldview of our ancestors, you got to have the scientific worldview of the truth. That cosmology, 
and ecology is what we need to master. The whites know this. The pharmaceutical companies that's making all this money right now off of COVID, they understand I must get all these herbs from nature. I must get the knowledge of what the herbs do and I must put it in the factory and make a pill and I will keep you sick enough that I can constantly feed you a little bit of healing, but not enough to make you better. And I will forever be wealthy because you are ignorant about what the ecology has to offer you to heal you, to cure you, or to keep you even from getting sick. But we don't think like that because that's not the way they teach us to think. You know? This is about freedom. Freedom doesn't mean running through the street with a gun. It may at some point mean that sometimes. And we should all know how to use a weapon. Every African in the world should own a weapon and learn to use it and teach the children and the women to use those weapons. But the weapons should be for the last resort in self-defense. The way you win a war is to get back your mind. The way you win a war is to free your spirit and your psyche from the hands of your enemy. And you won't have to lift a single gun to do that. He prefer the gun because he masters that arena. You understand? He masters the art of killing. History has proven that to be true. That's not my saying it. That history reward every word I've said. So we need to think. Husbands, wives, and we have crisis. And some people are not meant to live together forever. Some marriages weren't meant to last. I had two children before I got married by two different sisters, both of whom I had wished to marry and thought I would have married, and it didn't work. And so we stayed friends until they went to the ancestors. We didn't become enemy. We didn't hate each other because we had two babies to raise, Onika and Madeline. And they're both grown women now, beautiful women. The mothers are both gone to the ancestors now. But we didn't become enemies. We went on with our lives and realized we had different lives for ourselves, charted out in the future. So they marry who they married. Those men became my brothers and my friends. And I hope I was theirs. You know? And so when we think of what it means to be African, I've said it before, and a lot of people got a little, oh, you know. To be African is to be God. And I know you're afraid of that because all of the myth the enemy has given you, God in the sky and hallelujah, and, and this one is supreme. Why would God create something that was profane? Why would God create something that it has to destroy? Our concept of God is all wrong. Go back to the African concept of God. And I love the Yoase, I love the, the way the Ewe of Ghana and Togo, they say, Sogbe Lisa, Sogbe Lisa. The totality of creation is divinity. The totality of creation is divinity. And we, we are no more than an expression of an aspect of that divine essence having our peculiar experiences as humans. And so when they want to say the divine in the human being, they say voodoo godzi. But the enemy take our beautiful word voodoo and make it a defame word and come up with zombie movies and all kinds of foolishness. When the African, when they created that word, the word meant the essence of the divine itself. And then we would accept the enemy's defaming of our word for divinity while he's killing people. If you just utter their word without the proper pronunciation. This is about you, black people. Are you really African or you're just playing? But I'm not going to blame you because we've been in a war that we never expected. 
We extended our hands, thought we were reaching for a brother and a sister and a friend, and they chopped them off. We showed our head to show the love in our face, and they cut them off. So I don't blame you, but you know you are in trouble. So I now blame you for not turning to your ancestors for the answers, for not looking in history, because your history is your dialogue with your ancestry. Say that again. Your history is your dialogue with your ancestry. Know your history and your ancestor will get rid of the enemy's mystery about what life is. We know of the Chinese efforts in Africa from Zambia to Kenya to Tanzania to Ethiopia, but are we watching the hand? We didn't watch it when the Europeans came and they cut our hands off. Are we watching the Chinese hand to make sure that you don't import your surplus people to my continent? You don't import your surplus people to my continent and then they marry my woman and now they own my land. You know, and it sounds simple, right? But do that five million times and see how it gets. Send five million people, and they've already sent that many almost to the continent. Let them marry our women and have our children. They now are the owners of your land. If the woman is the custodian, any smart people would know what to do. And we can't make excuses. Well, oh, our man isn't doing this or doing that. At the end of the day, your future, your eternity, which is your great, great, great grandchildren will no longer even look like you. It will no longer even be you. And you will go out of being. If you think that's not possible, visit Tasmania and the Pacific and a number of other places on this earth where the people who were Aborigine and indigenous no longer exist. And another people sit there, you know, calling themselves Tasmanians, calling themselves um, New Guineans. And our people is no more taking us in New Caledonians. These are all African islands in the Pacific. We don't even know the genocide that's happening there against our people because we don't know our history or our relationship to our people. Learning history is not gonna stop you from fixing your hair. Learning history is not gonna stop you from putting on a tie and going out and having a good time with your friend. Learning history is not gonna stop you from looking in the mirror and seeing your beautiful figure with that dress. It'll actually enhance all those things because it'll give you more motives, more reasons mm -hmm. for being those things. Mm -hmm. We see Ghana, and Ghana is one of my favorite places because only because I've been there more. But anywhere I go in Africa, I feel right at home. I don't need nobody permission to come from America to Africa. I followed the law. I got a, a passport. But if I didn't have a passport, I know how to sneak in one country to the other. You think I have to go down the road where the soldiers are standing at, at the <laughs> check? I just go through the woods like everybody else do and go where I want to go, you know? And I've done it before. I'm not gonna get in trouble by telling you which countries. So we know that if we wanted to show that we don't care about your boundaries, just go in the bush 50 yards from the highway and you can cross any you want. There's nobody standing there with rifles and guns. It's a game we've played with our minds imitating the European, you know. So how do we really, and I think I was talking to Dr. Tata this morning and she was talking about how do we hold our own Berlin conference? And I love the idea. I, I thought about it, Dr. Susan on my way to physical therapy and I was like, you know, that's a smart lady. That's a real <laughs> smart lady. They held the Berlin conference and they came and chopped us up into pieces and disunited us. 
Why don't we hold a Berlin conference for the purpose of calling for the total pan African unity of all Africans? Those seem makes sense. Because we have to be serious. Having this conversation don't mean you have to quit your job or stop practicing medicine or give up law. This will now determine how you do all those things better if you know yourself. It isn't about ego and pride. You know, it's about truth and justice and love and harmony and reciprocity. You know? So people think, oh, Professor Small, I'm just like you. I'm an African man. I'm a brother. I'm my oldest brother in the living now is 83. 83. He calls me every week. When I was in the hospital, he called me every day. For four months, every day at 12 noon, my big brother called to see his little brother as well. And we've been like that since we were children. He's my brother. I love him. I will die for him. I know he will die for me because he's proven it over and over. My big sister, sometimes she can get honorary. She used to be a barmaid and the best barmaid. She attended bars. And in Harlem, she was so good that when a person opened a new bar, they sent for Sister Bibi. And she would come and teach the new women how to run the bar. And you know, bars are big business in Western culture. So she made a very good living doing that. And she was honorary. But my grandmother told me, you have to look out for her. And I go, Ma, I don't want to go to no bar. She said, you don't have a choice. Your sister in the bar, you in the bar. And so that I had to do. And we became very good friends. And sometimes she made my life very difficult. She got in the, it got in some tip with a big gangster one time. Um, the, 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 the bodyguard of a big gangster named Nicky Barnes. And he, the man slapped my sister. My sister took a bottle of Harvey's and break it over the man's head, knocked him out. <laughs> gangster and his people. Gangster. And so my sister's friends jumped into a sister. And so they're threatening what they're going to do to my sister. Of course, who does she call? She calls me. As I'm crossing the street, she said, there come my brother right now. <laughs> the people could have took me up before I got to the door. But that's my big sister. you know. And when, when, when I had the surgery, she calls me every week. She calls me darling. She says, hello, darling. You know? And I have to tell her, hello, darling. She's my son. You know? She washed my face when I was a baby. She carried me on her back. She changed my diapers. She's my sister. I'm 76 now. And she's 77, 78, 79. You know? But we still understand what our parents taught us. We still practice what our parents taught us, even though we had to go into the European world and a lot of times it broke our lives, fractured our lives. We still maintain that hold on being communal, collective, and cooperative as a family, as an yes. African people, because that's where we have to go. I have to know if I come to France and I'm hungry, that we know each other well enough, I can feel safe enough and comfortable enough that say someone knock on my door and say they're hungry, I can give him something to eat. Even if I'm not um, confident enough to bring him in the house, I can bring food out to him and know that I'm doing my duty. A brother who I haven't seen in 20 years from Nigeria called me two weeks ago and said, my son is coming to New York. He's been away from New York for about 15 years. Uh -huh. He's going to need to find work and a place to live. Who am I supposed to tell my brother? Oh, I, I don't have time for that. I had to say, give your son my number when he gets here. And even after last night, I'm calling different friends from Nigeria, from Ghana, from here, saying this boy is here, we got to find him a place. We can't say we don't have time for him. I could not tell you how the child looks like now because I haven't seen him since he was a little boy. He's almost 40. But I know I have that obligation as an African to do that, to make sure he finds a way to make a living and to make sure he finds a place to live.
That's simple, but that's big because that's being African. That's trying to stick to our foundation of communal collective cooperative. That's what Pan African mean. This is the Pan African Daily TV. That means this is the TV that's designed to unify African peoples through knowledge, information, and understanding. Mm. And people need to continue to support Sister Susan. We don't say that enough. If you don't support this platform, your enemies will have platforms that will help to destroy you. And when I'm on next week, I'll probably be able to tell you about some things that has gone on in the world against us as African people. But I can't speak on today because uh -huh. things are still in turmoil. And I don't want to hurt any of our people at this time. But we have to be clear that we are one people, no matter where we are in the world. That we have to be clear even on the continent. In Burkina Faso, they may speak Mose, they may speak something else, they may speak French, and in Nigeria, we speak English, and Yoruba, or Igbo, but we've got to understand that we need to find a way to communicate with the people in Burkina Faso. And Burkina Faso has to find a way to communicate with us. That should be our dying desire, mm -hmm. that we've got to reach to each other. We are all we got. Nobody in the world care about us. Nobody except us and they've taught us so badly we don't care about us anymore so we have to care about us and even if one of us do wrong we can't condemn and destroy them until we measured what wrong they have done to see mm -hmm. what punishment is worthy some of it may just be because someone is deaf, blind, and dumb, did not see what they were doing, and would never have wished the nation of Africa harm. Even though we know there's some who out of greed and being lost in greed will take money and other things to do us harm, <clears throat> thinking they won't live long enough to see the consequences of their actions. But we all know that's not true. Mbutu, Sese, Siko, or Zabanga of Congo, who helped to kill Patrice Lumumba, but the American CIA, the French CIA, and the Belgians, and the Brits was involved as well. The four of them, with Mobutu and his weak, backwards, alcoholic self, that col col colonialism had turned him into, murdered our prince, murdered our savior, and lived spending tens of millions of dollars of the people of Congo money and stored billions in the European banks that's never been given back to the people of the Congo. But he died like a ragged little dog where cancer had ate his body away and God would not let him die until he was thoroughly destroyed. Because there's no way you can do the harm that has been done and not suffer. And if you don't suffer, your children will, or your grandchildren will. We don't need to see in Zimbabwe what we almost saw when Mugabe was an old man, having given us so much, he lived in those bushes of Zimbabwe with that rifle in his hand and a little bit of food wrapped in a cloth while he ran through the woods fighting Ian Smith and the white apartheid occupiers won our freedom, kept our country from being recolonized. And then we turned on him when the enemy says he's unworthy and they're going to sanction him. Because we have no knowledge of the history of Zanu PF or the other liberation movements in Zimbabwe that led to that freedom that we had not had in almost 400 years then we would love Mugabe. He would be our Christ and Savior. Instead of waiting until he's given us all his life can give, and he's, in, what, 90 something years old, then we want to throw him aside because the European says, I'm going to sanction you. 
sanction me, then I sanction you. I close my gold mine. I close my diamond mine. I close anything that you can get. And my brother said, we close ours. Now you sanction somebody. But instead, the rest of Africa went along with the sanction except for a few of Zimbabwe. And our great hero, warrior, savior, Mugabe, who should we should fall to our knees on his birthday and give reverence and respect. Mm-hmm. Chris Hani, Nelson Mandela, and the goddess Winnie Mandela. Do we celebrate them every year? They didn't do all we wanted to, to, because I was very unhappy with Nelson. But he did probably the best he could do. Chris Hani would have gone a little bit further, because Chris was a little more shoot him up, bang, bang. Right? But they killed Chris. They assassinated Chris Hani of the ANC. The brothers and sisters of the PAC. Bombs were sent to their homes in Kenya and Tanzania, and you and they killed our beautiful children. We don't even know their names. We don't know your history. You don't cry for them. I cry for them. I feel them. They are me. Do you cry for them? And Yomo, former president of Namibia, I thought he had passed. I knew him when he was a young man. I supported Swapo. I helped students from Swapo go to school in America, got them scholarships. I helped train some to go back home and fight, you know, and listen to the Swapo song, We Will Win. And so a friend of mine from Ethiopia, when the crisis was there the other day, went to Namibia with an old friend. And she said, oh, I'm in the movie. I said, oh. I said, what is your friend name? And my friends have to be in Yoma. So they immediately took pictures so I could see my great revolutionary president. And he looks wonderful at this age. Love Africa. Love the people who fought for us. You know? Emma Carl Gabral in Guinea-Bissau. He not only fought in the bushes of Guinea-Bissau, he was a medical doctor. He didn't let a medical, being a medical doctor, stop him from being a revolutionary to free his people. And I remember the one thing he, he said to those who were Marxists and socialists, because sometimes they want to come and say, oh, we're the liberators, but then they want to liberate us from being Africans. And Gabral was very clear. If you don't liberate the people to practice their culture, you've simply imposed another tyranny upon and it was Zimagal Gabral that brought our struggle in America to the attention of the world. And he said every black American that is murdered in those streets an African from Guinea-Bissau has been murdered in the streets. He didn't forget us. And they assassinated him, that beautiful African man. We need to remember them, study them, and what were they saying that the people want to murder them? A beautiful young brother from um, Burkina Faso. All he was saying is do for self. He had gone to a conference and he told the African leaders at the OAU at the time that my shoes was made in Burkina Faso. My pants was made in Burkina Faso. My shirt was made in Burkina Faso. You weighing Louis Vuitton and you weighing this one and that one and that one. How are we going to free Africa if we can't even make the clothes the leadership way? But they killed him three weeks later. The very young man who was his friend, supposedly, and his vice president, who's now been charged with the death, with the death of Sankara. I'm talking about Sankara. Um, and I sat beside that young man and next to Sankara just two months before and thought that, oh, what a beautiful thing these two beautiful young men are together. But well, one had an African mind, Sankara did, an African spirit, and the other had a European mind and a European spirit. And the European mind murdered the African mind. 
like that Cain and Abel story in the Bible, you know, or the Zara Seth story in ancient Egypt, where envy and jealousy and ignorance and greed will allow you to destroy even the house of your mothers and your father. That's who a child is, a child is that house. So when we talk about Pan-Africanism, it's not just the phrase, it's not just the term. Pan-Africanism is gonna tell us how we're gonna put food on the table without submitting to, at the feet of our enemy. Pan-Africanism is gonna tell us how we're gonna clothe our family and build our houses. Pan-Africanism is gonna tell us, do we live in the slums of America and pretend when we go back home once a year, we're doing well? Do we live in the slums of London or France and we go home once a year with our little savings and try to make people think we're doing well? Or will we come right. to our senses and take the knowledge that we've gained abroad and go back home and do well and live well mm. in a communal, collective, cooperative way with our family? But we got to be serious. We got to stop being, what's that word? The, the, the bamboozled by the trinkets of the Western world. Because it's all illusionary. We don't realize until we old and our ankle has swollen and our belly is big and our hair is gray. <laughs> And we can't do anything now except die and hope to be shipped home if we got enough money to ship us home. Yes. Or be submitted and dumped somewhere. We have a lot to think about when we talk about pan Africanism. To be communal, to be collective, to be cooperative, to be one Africa. Again. It was not for us. We don't live that many years. Even if you make it to 75, 85, that's long. The average person is going to die before 75. You're going to be gone. So whatever sex you have, happiness you have, drinks you have, ganja you smoke, parties you dance at, this will all end. And most of it will end while you're still here and your joints won't let you dance anymore because it hurts too much. You're not going to take the alcohol too much anymore because it's going to mess up your liver. You're worrying about your high blood pressure and your sugar diabetes because you've eaten all the Western junk that gives you high blood pressure and sugar diabetes. And then you decide to figure out how to die. So while we have the time and enough help, let's think about our children's children. That's the motive for our fight. Our children's children, not to have to suffer what we suffered, should be the motive for why we will fight. Why we will take our doctor's degree and go back home. Why should Africa beg for doctors? We train all these people in our medical schools, and as soon as they get their medical degree, they go to America, England, France, or someplace else <coughs> to practice, and they don't come back home to us until they're old or they're dead. What are we doing that we should have more Cuban, a little island in the Caribbean? Africans, some of who are light-skinned, you would not know they were African, have sent more doctors to Ghana than Ghana have Ghanaians. That doesn't make any sense. But Cuba know that they're Africans more than the average African nation know that they're Africans in terms of obligation thanks to our great father, Fidel Castro, one of the great African leaders that no one wants to call a leader. So he Hispanic. Spanish is a language, not a race. And Fidel knew that. He practiced his Yoruba religion and he called it Yukomi. You know, he sent his brothers and sisters to Africa to die in Namibia and in Angola because he knew he was an African with an obligation to Africa. But do we know his story? No. Do we love Fidel? No. Do we honor Fidel once a year at least? No. Because we don't know the story. Do we know that out of Argentina come Ernesto Che Guevara into the Congo, 
sent by Fidel Castro to avenge the death of Patrice Lumumba? And he led the troops of Patrice Lumumba against Mobutu and with the other one, Kasabubu and the American insurgents and the British insurgents and the Belgian troops. You don't even know that Che Guevara was in Africa because you don't know your history. History will get rid of the European's mystery. You know, people talk about Malcolm X and surely he was a great man. He is one of my spiritual fathers. But they didn't kill him until he wanted to bring his movement into Africa to unite the Africans on the continent with the African Americans. They didn't kill him for being a Muslim. They could care less about that. Only when he met with Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, and Zikwe, um, uh, Gamal Nasa, um, the president of Algeria, and him and Che Guevara was about to come to a big meeting two weeks before that meeting in Algeria with um, Ahmed Ben Bella, Bella assassinated Malcolm X. Do you understand that? Do you know the history enough to, 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 to know when Malcolm X's relationship, he wasn't transformed by Islam. He was transformed by Africa. And he took a name, Omawali, Yoruba name to say the child who has returned home. And he was killed the month after he took that name. He was no longer Malcolm X or Hodge of Sabaz. He was Omawali. Then mm -hmm. Hodge of Sabaz, Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. History will erase the mystery. Because we hadn't, the Africans in the diaspora and the Africans at home, We've never ever really been separated. Study Chief Sam in Ghana, why he wanted to bring ships to America to bring us back. You know. Go and look and see how many Africans before the Americans freed us from slave or right after they freed us from slave before any colonialism fell and see how many Africans came to Tuskegee University to study under Booker T. Washington. And many went back home to go in the leadership of ANC and the leadership of the, the party that um, freed Malawi from slavery. We've always had a relationship. And we've allowed the white man to define those relationships in negative ways like he did in Liberia. Talking about a Merrill Liberian. There's no such thing as an Merrill Liberian. The people who had been enslaved in America and who had gone back home they purchased the land from their brothers and sisters. They didn't go and steal that land. They purchased the land. And even if it was the swamp, they purchased it with money to build a free place for themselves so they could get out of slavery in America and come back home. Mm -hmm. And as the years went and the rest of what became the greater Liberia merged with those people who had come the Americans kept their foot in the middle. And when Talbert was about to make the move and become the chair of the OAU, they pulled the coup. You know, with Sergeant Doe working for the American CIA. Yes, I'll say it. Tell somebody to come to me if they want truth. And you murdered the man who was about to really bring about some Pan-Africanism. And you burnt the Amy Church to the ground and you burnt the Prince Hall Lodges to the ground because the Americans told you to do it. You better study history or they'll give you a lie to keep you disunited. You've never heard of Martin Delaney. He's a great African-American or American-African in the late 1800s, fought in the American Civil War. He led black troops against the murderers and the segregationists who committed genocide against us. Yeah, we call it slavery, but we call it genocide. When you kill millions of people, that's genocide. 
when you keep them in, in, in bondage for hundreds of years, that's genocide. It wasn't a, a birthday party or a labor agreement we had with these people. This is not a work contract. Martin Delaney, before the Civil War in America, came back to Nigeria, which was not then Nigeria, to the place called Abiyokuta. Abiyokuta was where his grandfather was from. Abiyokuta is where some of my ancestors are from. We know Abiyokuta is a very special place and a very spiritual place. And he met with the others in Abiyokuta. This is before the American Civil War. And they formed an organization. It was called the Niger mm -hmm. River, River Valley Association. And they came back to America to bring us home. Because the people of Abiyokuta and the other areas gave them thousands and thousands of acres of land to bring them back. But the war, the Civil War in America started. So he said, then I'll fight here. And he became a major in the American army and fought against the Confederacy. And after the war, he fought hard to have Americans leave, Black Americans leave here and go to Liberia and Sierra Leone. <laughs> so there was never a time when there wasn't a fight for the unity of Africans at home and those of us in the diaspora. Sierra Leone came about mm -hmm. that same way. Many of us left here and Britain to go back to Africa. They had us enslaved in Britain as well. Most people don't know that. We go to Britain and we don't realize the people we see walk in the street in brown face, who they are. Those are the ones that came before the new immigrants who were enslaved in Britain. That's separate from the ones who came from the Caribbean. But Britain wanted to get rid of them because they had too many free blacks and they were scared of us. So they sent us back to Sierra Leone. And they sent the ones in Nova Scotia who had fought with the British against the Americans in the American Revolution. We went back to Sierra Leone. So our separation isn't as big and as long as you may think because you don't know history. Correct. So history will uh -huh. get rid of And now we have to face the situation in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and in Guinea-Bissau. We say, oh, they're military men. Maybe what we need right now is military men with common sense because we've had all these civilians and the poverty still persists. We have all these civilians and they're still writing contracts where we're getting 15% of our oil. What can we do with that? They're still writing contract. We don't know what the contract is with the gold, with the government and the gold mines and the Israelis and the other people coming in their long black jacket, taking our diamonds out. We don't even know who the contract is. Who's getting the money? Because we're looking at the wrong thing. We're looking at the bouncing ball of, am I going to have a Tiffany bag? Or am I going to be able to afford a Mercedes or BMW? <laughs> you know, build your own African car that's better than a Mercedes or BMW. That's all they did. They built the car with your money. Mm -hmm. Germany was stealing the money and the wealth from Cameroon, from Tanzania, from Namibia to build the Mercedes Benz. and the Volkswagen, the people's car. Can we not do the same thing if we had our own wealth? If we truly practice Pan-Africanism, if we truly practice communal collective cooperative, if we truly mm -hmm. had respect for our ancestors and respect for the history of Africa. Don't tell me because you speak this African language and I don't speak it, you have but you're practicing the religion of the enemy and you're cursing the way of your ancestors. You don't, you you know, you, you gotta understand how one yeah. identifies oh, yourself. Yeah. You're identified by your relationship to your ancestors' instructions, not mm -hmm. by your relationship to your enemy's instructions. And so we need yeah. to think really deep. So Ms. Susan, you always have me just be here talking and stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, 
this um, this this yeah. this talking this are these are two conversations that we miss prof mm -hmm. i mean i said we need to go to some work at, i mean we missed you here twice so we're catching up on anything that would have been said and like we say today is the african eyes we touch on everything you've touched about family you've touched about the relationship how we have to be the responsibility you've taught us i mean every day you you say it and say it and say it what is it that really make that difference and why we should be uniting this is the purpose so everything that you combine is like you giving us this is the re this is the reality and this is what you should be doing Mm -hmm. right it, it, it is like it, it's different in the church where they just say oh you know you pray and go out and all your problems will be but they don't actually but well, but what me, we do on the South african you you give them the answer. oh my god hello she is so cute so sweet <laughs> and this is oh. my malia Hi. Malia. Hello. Hello, Malia. How are you? Say hello again to Miss Susan. I'm good. Come down so they can see. Say hello, Dr. Tata. She, she's hello, shown. hello, hello. They're so sweet. Oh my God. They're <laughs> so cute. Cute, cute, cute. I'll come to visit you. Okay, Malia. Yeah, because I got 23 of them. Right. I know wow. what it has to be for me. Those, those are the two that live closest to me. But they come by to get their hair braided today. So, but the, the, the whole idea is any and everything we can do for the African community, wherever we are. If you are in London or you're in New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, there is a Ghanaian association somewhere there. I know this. There's a Nigerian yes. association. There's a Liberian association. Join them. There is in the African-American community, the NAACP. So you don't have to join the Revolutionary Black Panthers. That is scare people. But you can join the NAACP or a voters' rights movement. Join them. That's how you bond together. You work together. And for those of us who go to Africa, when I go, I ask, what can I do? I ask my king or my chief, whichever town or village I go to, what can I do to help you? And they will tell me, the school needs this. The clinic needs this thing. You know, that village may need this thing. So I will take you to meet the village uh, elders. So I will take you to meet the village mothers. And they're not begging me for anything because they offer things in return. I bring people yes. on tour. I have a tour company and I like to do the rites of passage for the women and the rites of passage for men. And these villages mm -hmm. set up the process. We know we can't do the ones that take six months, but in one or two days, they can give our people a sense of reconnecting by putting them through these rituals. Then we have the naming ceremony. You don't just get a name. You get a name from a particular family, and you're now a member of that family. Mm -hmm. the things we could do to reintegrate ourselves back into home. Yes, marriage. I mean, you see my name up there, Professor James Small. But in, in Ghana, I'm Nana, Kofi, I'm Pansa, Pansa. the second of the Agogo yep. school of the Ashanti region. Mm -hmm. And I've been in that position since 1984, reconfirmed for the position in 1992. Mm -hmm. And my uncle is in his 90s and he's still alive. Matter of fact, I heard that he was cussing me out the other day because I was supposed to call two weeks ago, but I don't call until I got the gifts I promised him. So I got to get everything yeah. together. And then I would call and say, oh, no, no. And then he would beat me up. And then he would ask me, how is my son? And how is my children? And he knows I love him. He's had three strokes and God has allowed him to come back. So it's a relationship. It's, it's about family. Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have wounds. Yes, there are things that are fractured and broken, but it'll only heal if we come back together with the intent of restoring the one Africa. 
And that has to be yes. our intent. That we're going to unify the one Africa. That has to be our intent. And so once we clear like that, freedom is easy because we already free. We just have to realize our freedom. You know, realize our freedom. If we live in America and you a recent um, migrant from the continent, you've been here 20, 30 years, go buy an apartment complex at home. Provide housing. You don't have to buy a 50-story building. Have a three, four apartment complex. You'd be surprised how that will grow. And with your relationship to others in the diaspora who go back and forth all the time, you should never not have clientele. And you'll be able to give work. I work at least 47 people at my hotel in Ghana. Right now we're closed because of the COVID, so I was trying to do some transactions even this morning to get the tax paid up, to get this paid up. Uh, but given 47 jobs is a gift. Given 10 jobs is a gift. That's a blessing. Yes. You know? So there are all kinds of things that we could do at home, even though we live abroad. Yes. There's multiple things we can invest in with our money. Mm. There's pharmaceutical yep. companies in Ghana. We don't have to invest in their pharmaceutical. There's pharmaceutical companies in Nigeria, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa. There are hotel complexes and corporations we can invest in because tourism is one of the third, the second or third largest business in the world. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have to just rethink how we see Pan-Africanism. It's really about our daily reality and unifying ourselves with our homes so the chain does not go broken. And, and I think um, Sister Ani wrote a book once called Made a Chain Be Unbroken. We allow the chain to get broken when we move away from home. We allow the chain to get broken, those of us who've been over here through the enslavement, and say, when our ancestors got out of slavery, they still felt a yearning for Africa. We've lost that yearning. How come they went through 400 years of terror and they still had Africa in their heart? And we've only been through 100 or so years and we've forgotten her already. So history is the one thing I always stress. And look at all of the 54 countries and just study them. You can take one a day on your phone. You can bring up one African nation a day and learn all the basics about them. You'd be surprised what you learn. There yep. are islands in the Indian Ocean with black people we never heard of. You know, we know of Madagascar, but all off of the coast of Madagascar are other islands with tens of thousands of our people living, some of them still under French colonial control to this day. And we don't even know their names. We're walking on the way we, we say we're going to take two months to know Africa. And so when we say 54 countries and the diaspora, we want mm -hmm. to take really, I mean, all right, we we, <laughs> we did uh, a small meeting today and we thought two months was with three months we can really know about Africa. So we put every country from A to zebra, you know, from yeah. from Angola to, to Zimbabwe or to this, from A to Z. And we treat every country, statistics, people, countries, um, um, you know, everything from A for Angola mm -hmm. to Z for Zimbabwe. Z for Zimbabwe. Or and, Zambia. And we, yeah, yes. that would be a beautiful thing, Sister Susan, mm -hmm. because if people understood, I don't think people understand how extraordinarily, if we just, just take um, the aesthetics, how extraordinarily beautiful Africa is. Mm -hmm. When you watch the people in their environment going about their day-to-day -day work, we have our skyscrapers, we have our big boulevards, we have our cities, we have our uh, nightclubs, we have all of those things. And if you want to go in the, Euro, the rural area, just like you go here, you can go in the rural area in America and find villages. We don't call them in villages in America, we say rural community. Well. There's rural communities in Africa too. They just build their house of different material. And you can see how a farmer lives and how they grow cocoa or grow sugarcane or grow cotton 
or grow vegetables. There's an area in Ghana when you're going towards the northern region, towards Tamale, and, and you're driving, and you pass through these fields, they grow only tomatoes and carrots. And all you can see, as far as the eyes can see, is the rows and rows of tomatoes. Now, people say, well, what do we do with all the tomatoes? By the next morning, they're in Europe. We plant and send it to Europe, sell it to Europe. But we need to get the skills uh, from our own agriculturalists and our young people coming home so our people can get better deals for their crop. We grow carrots, and by 5 o'clock in the morning, those carrots are on a plane headed for Europe or headed for America. You don't, they don't tell you grown in Africa. No, they don't say that. They just serve it to you. And you think it all comes from here. Some of the most beautiful flowers you see in Amsterdam and, and Holland is grown in Kenya. It's I can't show. Not in Amsterdam and Holland. <laughs> and then the in Germany, in all the year. shops. Yes. And they will call you, it's a fair trade. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you, you know, these are, these are flowers that, you know, all doesn't have to do with um, this. There are women that are picking them. But if you look at the, the meager loan that they give to mm -hmm. them, and most of these plants are just rotting here. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's too much privilege in this in this Western countries. They 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 have some kind of they don't even know how to 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 deal with you know waste even. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yes, it, it, it's it's a responsibility. That's the fact that when you don't know, you don't know. You just you you just. Well, doing the history of each of the country, I think you're going to really open some doors on the economic yes, of each country, the politics of each country, um, yes. what the youth is doing in terms of entrepreneurship in each country. And I think we'll open a completely new door to how you see Africa, you know, because African folks who've decided I'm not leaving home, they're not worried about this foolishness in the West that we're worried about. They're going about their beautiful lives, enjoying their family and themselves and their day, sending their children to school in the morning, make sure those children is home safe, trying to help them get into university and get the profession they need, you know. And that's another thing that those of us in the diaspora can do is sponsor one child college education. It doesn't cost that much money. That's the reason why, it, you know, it's just because, okay, and COVID gave us the opportunity to connect in this other way. But we're trying to put this event uh, like the one in Senegal. When we talk about these festivals, it's a meeting point. And this meeting point, we have all the projects. We have the expo. And this expo, actually, the way we're redesigning it with our Renaissance college, it has to $100. You can invest from $100 too. But when we do it in the kind of the structure that we're putting is like, I give you my $100, you turn that capital and you give me back the $100, maybe in installment. So we're doing that kind of business like this. And then oh, you have to pay pay me and this this is the kind of fair way that we can support it's the same thing like you say we can adopt a village we can adopt a county we can adopt a child there's just so much to do if we if we do the mathematics that you were saying and we calculate how many of us are in the diaspora how many of how many communities in the continent because on the continent like you were saying in in, in here they say rare areas in the on the mm -hmm. continent we have components we have what we call the village and we have mm. what we call a compound. These are mm. two units that are very essential to, for us to just understand. The village, like they say, it takes a village to raise a child. A compound is very important. So you have the village, the totality, and then you have the compound, the family compound. And in this mm. compound, nobody leaves. The, the, the men, they go, they marry, they come back to the compound, even the girls. All these things we hear today about bride price and stuff like that, those are things we're going to treat. And you will understand it from that concept to see our parents, our ancestors were never stupid. Even when they give uh, our, our children, our girls in the hands of the married, most of them, they will always tell you, oh, no, no, no. You know what? If it is not comfortable, we just bring, bring my daughter to the compound. That's what the compound was. 
So I could get married out, but I still have my place in my father's compound. I can walk in any time. No culture yeah. teaches you that. The culture of divorce that we all learn is everybody for himself. And so when you leave the nest, you just leave. In Africa, we never leave the compound. The boys yeah. come with their, even in-laws even move into the compound. Okay. And, and the daughters in laws, they go and bring even families. And so it's always that kind of a unit. And those are all structures that we have to learn. But what I was saying that you're talking about entrepreneurship and stuff, when we meet what they're coaching, we have people from the continent and they present their projects. We're there. We look at it. Okay. This one needs to start a thing in fabrics, you know, in hand making clothes. Do you need this woman needs this? this all it's just it's any best and you just see all you need maybe is just to guard is that is unity enough there's just a lot we can do so let's just start doing it like you're saying prof just that <laughs> yeah there there is um the key thing is the concept of unity the one africa you know? yes and, and to look at the concept of communal collective and cooperative and realize we want to establish primacy over the economics of our community, the politics mm -hmm. of our community, and the culture of that community. And we mm -hmm. never let go of our land so we can ensure labor and proper access to the resources in the land. And I, I think when we start thinking in that African oneness, by learning the history, like you're talking about the compound, most people don't know what you're talking about yet. We're going to have to show them. You just help us to see a little bit of how a yes. compound functions. But as they learn more of a compound, which is the family and the extended family living in a collective relationship that extends even beyond the boundaries of the compound into the next compound. And when yes. people understand those compounds come together and create the greater community or village that we all live in. And that what Absolutely. we produce here collectively, we get rewarded from cooperatively. So oh, yes. that's the African way. And that's what we need to reinstate. We can't supplant this false notion of democracy, even the false notion of capitalism. You know, I'm not against profit. People have to make profit. That's how you survive. But I'm against exploiting people so one or two can make great profit. That's how we ended up dying. Um, and and so sure. And they will be people with greater wealth, fine. You have the greater wealth, but you must yes. contribute from that wealth to the building of the community. You can't make exactly. the wealth in the country and bank it in England. Make the wealth in my country and bank it in America. If you make the wealth in Africa, you got to bank it in Africa. Mm -hmm. And if we insist upon that, or at least a certain percentage being banked in Africa, we will then be able to get control and access to wealth for the farmers, for the laborers, mm -hmm. the mechanics, mm -hmm. for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the plumbers, the people who have to buy the tools to do the kinds of job that keep a society going day to day. But you have to want to do this. You have to want to grow Africa, just mm -hmm. like you do a plant in your house or in the field. You gotta water it, you gotta nurture it, you got to pull the weeds from around it. Well, you have to nurture the economy that same way. You have to nurture your relationship that same way. And it takes time. It takes time. Yes. We have to basically learn everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. We have to learn that there are some traditional meals that you don't eat with a calorie, eat with your finger. And what does that mm -hmm. mean? You know, I just posted some things like awakening our memories. These are spiritual connections. They just some the cutleries is just a break, it's a bridge that all these things that are metallic or things that have never. And so we have to go back and all, all the when we meet, we can do all those workshops, we can train ourselves. You you have what today is called um uh, the Senegalese rice, but a lot of Africans always think rice came from Asia. And to right. today, why did they call it Senegalese rice? And it's a brand globally. And they never eat it with a cutlery. They eat it with their fingers. So when we look at Chinese, eat rice with the, with the sticks. And it's like, ah, oh, the whole world is. They all learn all those things from us. And we were not even using sticks. We use the fingers to eat. Before, 
before America, we made money off of tobacco, and before America made money off of cotton doing slavery. You know what the greatest commodity in America was? It was called white gold. It was West African rice, not Asian rice. Yes. West African rice. Africa has three rice strains. One, I think one dry land or two wet land or two dry land and one wet land. But anyway, they're harvesting even today African rice and selling it as Asian rice. They yes. Really minds, they just can't say this is an African rice. Or like coffee comes from Ethiopia. Ethiopia discovered the coffee. And today, um, Uganda produces some of the sweetest beans in the world. Maxwell House and the others are all using it, but they'll never say it came from Africa. They'll think so. You're going to package it like somewhere and send it in Asia. Yeah. Packaging. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but all of this is where the young people have to come in. We have to retell the story. Yes. We have to modernize yes. the history. Um, mm. when we opened a coffee um, restaurant in Africa. Don't name it after the American one. I forgot what the thing named. But make it an African brand, you know? Let it be Tanzanian mountain coffee. I mean, Tanzania and Kenya have some of the sweet, next to Uganda, some of the sweetest coffee beans in Africa. And no one talks about the coffee that comes from Kenya or the coffee that comes from Tanzania or the coffee that comes from Uganda or from Ethiopia. But we have to begin to do that. We must have Kilimanjaro coffee. We must have Ranzuri coffee. But we Serengeti, have to... all these parts. So, but the time will come. I believe that the young people understand the message. Um, that is your Africa. Go take it back. And you don't necessarily... I believe everyone, again, should own a gun for self-defense. Have bullets to go in your gun for self-defense. Learn how to use it for safety's sake. But to win this revolution, take your mind back. If you take your mind back, the revolution is won. Okay? You take your mind back, the revolution is won. Because it's about understanding that without the culture of Africa being reasserted so you can reinvent yourself as an African, the economic and the political victories will not matter. And we've already proven that that's the sake. We've had major economic um, victories across the African world. We have major political victories across the African world. But because we lack the ethical, moral barometers of African culture, we have not been able to turn the economic and political victories into freedom. Ashe, correct. There's no no negotiation on that word. Mm-hmm. Period. Yep. That's why no matter how how educated we are, if your mind doesn't belong to you, you see why we yeah. we have a lot of scholars and stuff like that, but they're not African in scholar in in this in in this way, and and we keep always just being brown in the skin, coconuts and white mm-hmm. in the inner part. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Thank you, thank you, Prof. I mean, I just took I, this quotation that I think we leaving you or you leave us with. Take your mind back; the revolution is won. And I think, like, own your Africa, own your riches, fight for it. It's there; nobody's stopping you. The rivers are there, the cash crop is there, the the, the communities are there. Buy land, put people, young people on the street, remove them from the street to do agriculture, transform these things with all the skills. You don't need too much. That's why we're starting with a small, small capital. It's just like the Pan-African. We're looking for If we get 30 people that, that bring, and I think that's what we should do because the problem is always the volume of the money. When you, you, you even if somebody wants to help and then you ask that person 100,000, 6,000 or 20,000, even 10 or 5,000, it mm-hmm. is. And because we are a collective, it has to be a communal general thing. So we are not just the one-on-one selfish people go to a bank, lend some money, and then uh, give out here to invest. Like Professor James has said, I also had a lot of people for the past uh, uh, two years being on the Pan-African in, in this six-digit number. 
you know, to buy the Pan African off. But we say no, it's for the continent. But we need the whole village, the whole community to be a part, even if it's just 50 euros. And all of us will come in in two times because the more we get more people get it, the more we own it because it's on my property continent. Small at the village did they had um couple women will gather like 30 or 20 or 50 or five even and they go to your own farm because they didn't have that illustration and that machinery and they gather at one uh, woman's uh, farm and they till it and the next day they will go to the others and you hear them singing their songs with their babies on the back and this is what you you cannot buy it for nothing and so we join we finish your own we joined for one week, for one month. They've tilled the whole community, but they always went in groups. And so every group economy is not it, it start in Europe. It didn't start even in China. It started right mm. down in our villages. Our mothers did it long time ago. They didn't need industrialization. Today we're saying, oh no, the problem with Africa is because they don't have machinery and this and that. No, I carried my genius on the back and we went until the land nothing happened on the contrary we stay healthy and that's why they love the longer not just uh, uh, uh that we can do it's a collective thing we want to fund one project we come thousands of us and we put five five euros it becomes more nobody's going to give us a million we don't want their million they can do anything they want to do. Oh, no, we see you're doing a good job. No, we have a funding. We can fund your projects. So this, we say no. We're, so, we, we, we're just so African that you don't, even, you don't even need somebody to give you something. We don't even accept gift because we have just too much. If we don't know their intention, don't give, don't take. So we're not begging anything and asking anybody or anything. That's not African. That's not African to say, oh, we need development. No. An African will not even take your, your something if he doesn't know that you're doing it out of love. Mm -hmm. They will never take you any. So that's how that's how proudly African we are. But it's everything is so twisted up that, oh, no, we even use the word we need to help. No, in Africa, some word in some dialect doesn't exist. The word help doesn't exist in any language. It is support. It's family. And it's a privilege even because you some people that don't even take so if they even take it, uh, you are happy that people could take your support. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's how Africanness, when we talk about the, the village and the compound, I'm telling you, we're going to break these things. You will be so damn proud of being an African. There would be no reason. The money of family, of village, of compound, this, you can never regret anything, to be honest with you. Well, everyone wow. must remember yes everyone must remember we have everything we need yes. we don't have to look outside for anything you know um, our fishermen need a motor boat there are those of us who can buy an outboard motor for four or five of fishermen in that village and like this sister saying, we're not giving you anything um, because that fish that you catch, we want to make sure that for that motorboat, you distribute fish to those who can't get to fish. So yes. the elderly get their fish, the hospital get their fish, the other place Correct. get their fish that normally would not get it because we help you do this thing. Um, there's so many things we can do and, and just do it joyfully. Uh, when yes. I come, my nana I said, oh, I'll bring my sleeping bag if you don't have room. And he goes, like, no, I'll give you my bed. You know, yes. you take my bed draft. And, you know, I cannot take the nana's bed. So we fight over who's going to sleep in the bed. Yes, <laughs> um, exactly. So it's, 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 it's a, a coming back into a humanity that you can't find. You find it in the West, but not in so many places i can't deny that it doesn't exist but we know the limitedness of its existence africa have a humanity that have not even been spoken to in the world circles because it put a challenge on others to be that way you know 
So we have to, as African people, think communal, collective, cooperative. We must think in terms of the compound and the village. We must think in terms of the economic, politics, and culture that's necessary, safety and security. And we must also do that in the context of understanding that Pan-Africanism isn't just a word. It is a process of working together to become one again. And it isn't just on the local village level. We have people who can do it. There are people, there are certain safe kind of fertilizers you can use. So why do we impose, import the European poison fertilizer that you could make a bomb out? It's so poison, it's a bomb. <laughs> How crazy can you get? If I want to build a bomb in America, I just need to buy a bag of, of, of a fertilizer. So we can finance organic fertilizing of our plants. You know, we can talk about trucking so we can get the produce to market. You know, we talk about helping the village build the roads between one village to the next village so we can come and get our produce. We see people doing it every now and you see the trucks with so much coal on the top, you think it's gonna flip over any minute. And yet he's still stepping along the road, getting more coal, charcoal to put on the truck, to take to the marketplace. So we look at what are the needs? We ask the villagers, what do you need in this particular village, in this particular region? And, and there's an original administrator. There is the house of chiefs. There is the house of queen mothers. So these are the people you address. And they will tell you, we need this thing, this thing, this thing. And then you build a relationship on what's reciprocal. We need something too. So we will bring you these things. And what we get from you are these things. Maybe in America, we need cocoa butter because everybody now is using cocoa butter. Every major um, industry, um, what do you call it? Cosmetic industry in America is using cocoa butter. Almost every food industry product in America is using African cocoa butter and some are going to the Pacific to get it, but Africa is closer in all regards. So we says, okay, you need trucks to move that product. You need plants to mix that product. We'll process it here, but we want to have a discount to buy it to sell to the black marketplace in America. There's so many things we could think of. You think of cocoa butter, just one jar for yourself. But when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds of cocoa butter, being sold into the marketplace in America every day. And we're not seeing the profit, we being the African people from that cocoa butter that's used in almost everything in America today. I was shocked the degree at which cocoa butter is used in America, not just in the, in the food industry, but in the cosmetic industry and in other industries. So we need to wake up and say, how, okay, why are we going to let another racial group control the flow of cocoa butter from Africa to black America? Does that make sense? <laughs> and in many other industries, we, we need shoes. Everybody buys shoes. Ethiopia has one of the best leather industries in the world. I think the same thing with Mali and, and with um, Nigeria. So why are we buying our leather from somewhere else? when we can have our shoes made right there in Africa and we sell them in America. There's just so many industries available to be created. You know, that's how you get a one Africa. We have a right to live anywhere in the world we want to live. And that should not stop us from building the Africa we want to see. Correct. You know. Absolute. It's a spirit. I don't have to, soon, I'm gonna have to go and play granddaddy, play grandpa. And fix my baby some lunch. But I hope we've given you a message today that being a Pan Africanist is not difficult. You don't have to join an organization and wear a banner or wear a collar. You don't need none of those things. Pan Africanism is an act and a process. It's a spirit. How yes. Behave, how you behave towards Africa and things African. You Correct. write Pan Africanism into communal, collective, and cooperativism. Mm. And you're really on the road to creating the one Africa that you want to see. And that's what we have to be about 24-7, 365. <laughs>
365. Thank you so very much, Prof. And um, your energy is amazing. And um, and I think the energy you give us, we give you back. And so that knee actually has to recover as soon as possible. But yes, take oh, your time. My knee is coming well. Uh, I'm definitely yeah. going to be ready for Senegal and the conference, and I'm definitely going to be coming into Ghana and maybe Togo and Benin in July. So yes, um, I'm getting ready to come home. Beautiful. Yes, we've been sitting down for two years. It's the time um, mm. to more take the actions that we've been talking about for two years. And um, there's no better way to do it than now. Thank you so much. Thank you okay. for all of you that have been watching. Yep, and um, yeah, we are here tomorrow and the next days, and we connect and we do our action on the spot. We have to stay and, just and focused. Thank you so much, bro. Let's let's tell the people to don't just listen to me when we talk about spirituality, but take it with you. Um, do everybody should have a, an altar in the house for your ancestors? It's just a simple thing to do. To have a simple small table, put a nice white cloth on the table. Put um, a glass of water that you change every day to let them know you're refreshing them. And have a smaller glass where every now and then you give them some pine wine or some rum. I even give them a little kibasi every now and then. You know, we have a nice treat. If the family is having a special day, like even Thanksgiving or even those who celebrate Christmas or, or Ramadan and you're having big food, Make a little plate with just a tiny bit of that food and set it there for them. You know, um, we know they're not going to come and sit and eat the food with the knife. It's a symbolic gesture to a power and energy that created you. You know, mm -hmm. um, you have a candle, usually white. Sometimes people may have yellow or red, depending on the message. And you light it during special times when you want to meditate. And on that table, you have the photographs of your grandparents and your uncles and aunties who have passed or your great parents who have passed. And you come to them to meditate and ask them to help you get through the difficulties that you have during the day or just to come and say, I had a good day today or I had a rough day, so I'm going to lean on you for about 10, 15 minutes, then I'm gonna go fix dinner. But have that place where you can see the faces of your ancestors and let them know you're their child and you'll never stop being that and let them come into you and 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 show you how how to maintain the integrity of african spirituality african sacred science and then study your history i didn't do it in the past but i suggest everybody put a history book a good african history book written by african persons on your altar also. So every now and then, read to them. Then I'm going to read to you about uh, Ya Santiba. I'm going to read to you about um, Papa Legba. Well, I'm going to read to you about, um, um, uh, what's the, the brother who was the head of the Zulu nation, or Brother Shaka, or Bambata. Shaka. Yeah, and, and just that, when you hook up that communication, there ain't nobody going to mess with you in the world. You understand? They'll see when you walk in the door, you're not alone. They'll feel that you are not alone, so don't mess with this person. Hmm. When you're walking out there in the street, they'll know that person, I'll step aside because there's something around that one. And you'll learn over time how energy and matter, just as it is said in the law of physics, can neither be destroyed. And you learn to capture that energy that's no longer housed in the matter that you used to mm -hmm. call your grandparents. And they'll always be with you. But that's enough sure. one day on African spiritual understanding, which is different from religion. You know, and you can have a religion. It's a good place to communal, cooperatively, be with other brothers and sisters who think and believe as you do. But when that religion cuts you off from your ancestors, throw it away. Anything that cuts yes. you off from your mother and your father and your grandparents, and your grand you don't need that thing. Mm -hmm. And just remember, any of the holy books you pick up from the Rig Veda of the Buddhists, from the, the book 
of, of the Japanese, the, the Shinto. So the Bible, Torah, and the Quran, everybody that's mentioned in there is dead. They're the ancestors of somebody. So how you let yourself submit to merely worshiping the ancestors of these other people when you don't even have respect for the ancestors of yourself. We understand. It's yeah. simple. Simple. It's very it's interesting. Yes, it is. True. True. Okay, yeah. Dr. Tata, it's always an honor to be with you. It's always an honor to be yes. with an African Daily TV family. And let's just be strong and let's free our Africa. Um, I will have more to tell you about this Egypt situation later. Um, it saddens my heart. When are you coming for? When are you coming next week on Friday again? Whatever is good for you. Is Friday good for you? What's best for you? Oh. Uh, no, then that's just... you take your time. Whatever is best for All you, right. you call me and let me know. Okay, Prof. Okay, thank you sister. so very much. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Blessings. Bye. Peace blessings. Bye bye now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Thank you. The big, big family that has been here. We we are almost three hundred still here. Wow. I mean, and from this uh, two different sources that we connected to. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. That's the and we're sending you into Ken with blessings and love. And you all heard it. Be African. Stay African. Please, please. Don't be somebody else. <laughs> please. Mama Bello talked to us yesterday, Professor Baine, and we know it. Eat what you want to eat, dress how you want to dress, but purposefully, right? If you want to carry a big kinky like me, you know you're doing it to preserve the honor and the authority in a big world, right? Anything purposefully for African. So I want to thank you, my brothers and sisters, and this family here, daughters that are also on the continent and across, that we see us tomorrow. I forgot the ritual thing to start with breathing and then drink water. Did you all do it? I didn't stop during the show, even with the prof vacation, and we already started late because he was running late. I forgot. But please don't forget. Don't forget we have to do it. Just breathe in seven times and out. Okay? So you take a breath in. Let's go and do it. The first, take it in. Out. Second time in. Out. Third time, breathe in. Out. Fourth time, breathe in. And out. Fifth time. In. And out. And the sit time, breathe in. And out. And the last time, breathe in and out. This is what Mama Bello taught us yesterday. Sometimes just breathe. Just breathe and drink a lot of water. But when you drink it, say it in the name of your ancestors. So those are the two things we're going to be doing on the Pan-African Daily. Please don't forget. If I forget tomorrow... I know you on the chat are already here. Please remember me. We start with the breathe in, breathe, in, breathe out, and water. Okay. Thank you so very much. We see us tomorrow. Yes. And somebody said breathing in that Tanzamite. Yes. The Tanzamite or the Afronite. Okay. Good night. We see us tomorrow. Bye-bye.
You are watching the Pan African Daily TV with Dr. Susan Tata. The Africa we want. Unity, consciousness, our culture, our spirituality, our history. One Africa for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.